Good morning. I'm Rosemary Pena, president of the Black German Heritage and Research Association and adjunct professor of German studies at UBC Vancouver. Today is the 11th and final event in our spring conversation series. Dr. Emily Frazier Rath, our students and I are excited to welcome Dr. Heidi Renee Lewis into our virtual classroom this morning. And as we are all eager to get the show on the road, so to speak, I'll ask Emily to please share a little about our class here at Davidson College and then to formally introduce our very special guest, Dr. Heidi Renee Lewis. Emily? Thank you, Rosemary. My name is Emily Frazier Rath, and I'm a visiting assistant professor of German studies at Davidson College, which is a small liberal arts college just north of Charlotte, <laughs> North Carolina. I'm also the executive director of the BGHRA. We are so excited to invite Dr. Heidi R. Lewis to our class, to Davidson College, and to the BGHRA today. Today is April 28th, 2022, and we, Dr. Pena, me, and most importantly, our incredible Davidson students are in our final week of the semester, the official semester, uh, together. Uh, together this, this semester. So we're ending on a good note. This semester, Dr. Pena and I are so pleased to have another opportunity to work with Davidson students as we co-teach our second course together. German 351 or Race, Gender, Migration asks us to employ a critical lens informed by Black German studies to questions of migration, belonging, and identity. As these big human topics intersect with Germany, Austria, and Switzerland, with the German speaking world, and with the lives and experiences of global Black German community. This class, like its predecessor, consists of three parts. It is first an exploration of the aforementioned themes as they are, or could be, handled in the field of Black German studies. Second, it is a community-based learning course as we support the BGHRA through our work and will feature our final projects in the BGHRA archive. And third, it is most importantly, an opportunity for students and through these recordings, our broader BJHRA and Davidson communities to speak with people whose lives and work intersect with, influence, shape, and inform Black German studies. Before Dr. Pena and I fade into the background, it is my pleasure to introduce Dr. Heidi R. Lewis. Dr. Lewis is Director and Associate Professor of the Feminist and Gender Studies Program and Inaugural Coordinator of Early Career Faculty Development Programs at Colorado College. Her areas of specialization are feminist theory, politics and discourse, particularly Black feminism, hip hop culture and discourse with an emphasis on rap and critical media studies. And she has published in The Cultural Impact of Kanye West, The Journal of Popular Culture, The Journal of Black Sexuality and Relationships, and the German language text, Indivisible Alliances Against Racism. She's also the author of forthcoming essays examining FX's The Shield, VH1's Love and Hip Hop, Bravo's Married to Medicine, and the relationships between expertise, quote unquote, and women's studies. She has contributed to Mark Anthony Neal's New Black Man, NPR's Here and Now, and Bitch Media, and has given talks at Vanderbilt, the Motherhood Initiative for Research and Community Involvement, Cornell, the US Olympic Committee, Portland State, and many more organizations and institutions in the US and Germany, uh, including for the BJHRA and Davidson um, this past Monday. On that note, uh, Dr. Lewis's first book in Audrey's Footsteps, Transnational Kitchen T Table Talk in Berlin, co-edited with Dana Maria Asbury and Jaslyn Tate Andrews, was recently published in Ingeborg Bachmann Prize winner Sharon Dedua O2's Witness, an English language book, bleh, English language <laughs> book series uh, published by Edition Assemblage that features Black authors who have lived in Germany. In Audrey's footsteps relies on black and transnational feminist theoretical frameworks and methodologies to amplify the resistive and generative experiences of black women and women of color educators, artists, art activists, and scholars who consider themselves friends in the struggle. While being particularly attentive to racism, heterosexism, 
colonialism and other forms of oppression and subjugation in Audra's footsteps also examines how these women reject, resist, and revise oppressive narratives as they develop their subjectivities, as well as the always advantageous, but sometimes contentious contours of solidarity. We have read portions of um, In Audrey's Footsteps Yay. today in preparation for yes, our conversation. <laughs> and we're excited now, um, I'm excited to turn things over to Dr. Heidi Lewis and to our students. Thank you, Dr. Pena and Fraser Rath for having me two times this week. I'm so thankful and honored to do that. Um, before I talk a little bit um, and then open it up for questions, comments, dialogue, two things. When are you going to Berlin and what did you read in the book? <laughs> and I should, I should grab it. I'm like, where is my book? What, yeah, what <laughs> are you going and what did you read? So we're going in what two and a half weeks. We're going, um, let's see, May 17th through the 24th. Awesome. And uh, for today, we read, someone help me, the preface, the foreword, the first chapter, the epilogue. Am I forget the afterword? Uh, that, yeah. Yeah, that's what I meant. Um, anything else? Oh. Yeah. Okay, cool, cool, cool. Great, that'll that'll um, help me at least get situated. Like, what did, what did they read? Um, all right, so I am going to um, since you all, I think either attended the talk that I gave earlier this week or at least watched the recording. Um, I'm gonna pivot from that and talk more about my course. So um, I thought that would be. Um, appropriate since you all are undergraduate students. My course is, um, the college where I work, Colorado College, is primarily undergraduate students, a liberal arts college like Davidson. And so I thought if I talk about the work that I've done with my students, it could sort of, um, along with the book and the conversation from earlier this week, it could sort of give you um, a unique way to think about and, and experience Berlin when you go. So. I'm gonna share my screen because I am um, always worried that, well, I love pictures and I love videos. And I also um, worry sometimes that without my stuff, I'll be less engaging. So um, before we get started, the my course is entitled Hidden Spaces, Hidden Narratives, intersectionality studies in Berlin. Um, that wasn't the original name of the course. And I, I, I hope I'll remember to say a little bit more about that. Um, but if not, and you're interested in the change, please do remind me. And so um, here's the description of my course, the official course description. Um, through myriad multidisciplinary critical perspectives, such as black feminism, transnational feminism and critical race theory, my course examines how the identities of Black, Jewish, Turkish, LGBTQI communities, as well as immigrants, migrants, refugees, victims of neo-Nazi terrorism and police brutality and other marginalized people are constructed in Germany. Particularly how these constructions are dependent on racism, heterosexism, colonialism, and other forms of oppression. Additionally, and I would argue most importantly, it examines how these people and communities resist and also reproduce these narratives as they construct their subjectivity. So very similar to um, what Dr. Fraser Rath said about my book, um, although there's a there are just unique focuses. So before I begin, I just I'm going to allow my former students to talk about their experiences in the course for a few minutes here. I loved meeting with the people who's doing the work in Germany. I remember thinking to myself, all these people need to be in all of the history textbooks when my grandkids are in school. And I love that the course challenged me to grow, not only academically, but also socially, more as like a citizen, a peer, a student, and a friend. It was like a huge scavenger hunt. And with each place that you got to go, you got to learn something new and special. It's like a new part of the puzzle of Berlin, you know, a hidden piece. 
Um, I really so, enjoyed the Bellin call, like the cause. It was amazing. Um, great food, great people, great company, and a lot of intellectuals and books. And it's Berlin. On top of that, Heidi just connects with the most amazing creative people who teach you something that you have you had <laughs> yeah no idea about. she's like really enjoying like, the coursework as well just like meeting like a lot of different people throughout the city of berlin understanding like intersectionalities um black identity kind of like seeing like um how the black power movement has been like working in berlin considering that like it started about like 32 years ago now yeah so it's just like my favorite part about the course was the speakers that we met. We met with activists, authors, and poets, just people who were very familiar with Berlin, had a personal experience with being of color in Berlin, and we got a very genuine and honest perspective from And going off of that, it was also a really humbling experience to be learning all this theory in the classroom and then being able to be invited to these communities that are doing all of this work um, and continue to do all to this work on the ground. To be staying in a place where there was such an intense history of discrimination and to be learning about the current groups that were being discriminated against and how they intersected was really interesting and incredibly relevant to the course. Each day we were going to new places and meeting new people and seeing new things and thinking about things that I never would have even considered before taking this course, things about Germany, about social justice, about equality. I mean, it's just crazy, things about even my own life. I also really loved the tour guides and all the tours. They're super knowledgeable about Berlin. Um, it's such a cool city and there's so much to learn. Um, and it is really interesting to learn about um, different organizations that are actually like creating a lot of communities and, um, really cool spaces and projects. It pushed the way that I thought about race and gender to a higher level than other CC classes have required. And it taught me to embrace practical solutions and messiness instead of just looking to a textbook. Uh, thank, look, thank you students who many have graduated. Um, but I always, um, whenever I start promoting the course to get students interested, I always include that so that students can hear about it from another student perspective. Because although we share a lot of experiences in Berlin, we, we experience it very differently because of my positionality and theirs. But um, I talked a little bit about this when I spoke earlier this week, but I'll just reiterate that I became interested in developing the course in 2012 after thinking more seriously about how to further develop the curriculum in feminist and gender studies at Colorado College um, intersectionally and transnationally, and also to um, respond to the overwhelmingly white study abroad curriculum um, at CC as a whole because of the fact I'm sure that the faculty are, are predominantly white. And then as a reminder, I chose Berlin because I wanted my work to honor existing black radical intellectual traditions set forth um, by Dr. W.E.B. Du Bois, Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., Angela Davis, Dr. Angela Davis, Audre Lorde and others who were influenced intellectually by their experiences in Berlin. So um, I didn't want to, I didn't, want to start from scratch when I had this rich um, history of relationships between U.S. Black intellectuals and, and Germany. Um, and also because of the ways that the relationships between intellectuals, uh, Black intellectuals in the U.S. and Germany is underrepresented and understudied in ways that say it's not the case for Paris. Um, I wouldn't suggest that a whole lot of people are familiar with or, you know, um, or, or experts in the relationship between um, Black radical intellectuals in Paris, but more people know about that, um, thinking about James Baldwin and other um, Black intellectuals who were moving and shaking during the Harlem Renaissance and after um, being expats in Paris, more people know about that than they know about the Black tradition in Germany. Um, and so that sort of motivated me to pursue teaching there. And then I started reading all the things about 
um, black people in Germany, black women in Germany and got um, more inspired, uh, which is um, indebted in large part to Audre Lorde. And so just to give you a sense of the power of the relationships that Audre built in Berlin, I can say it, the book is trying to say it, but I'm gonna also show you a very short, less than one minute clip of um, Yasmin Edding, who was also instrumental in creating spaces for black movement in Berlin, who read um, the book Showing Our Colors and was inspired to pursue a life of, of activism. And here she is speaking with my students about that alongside uh, Rhea Cheatham and Judy Gummich, who co-wrote my forward with her. So that's why I wanted to put a clip so you could kind of see her, hear her voice. And also with Marion Kraft. Um, I was uh, at a friend's house and I saw a book from Audre Lord. And the back of the book was um, the ad for showing our colors. And I read the title and I think, wow, it sounds very interesting. I need to get this book. And um, I got it. Um, you know, it was a present from my sister. Yeah, she bought it for me. And uh, I started to read and to read. And I was so excited and so flashed because everything what was in the book you know, was, was me. It was like looking in a mirror and finally what I felt and thought was uh, giving a voice to other black uh, women. And I mean, it's, it's you know, as, as much of a relationship as I, as a black woman have with um, subjugation, oppression and resistance in the US, I always, every time I go, I say this to students, I say it just in conversation because it never ceases to amaze me. Um, this book that she's referring to that we, all, not all of us in the book, but we referenced several times in my book was the first book to be published by Black Germans. Ika's, um, Ika Hugo Marshall's autobiography, Invisible Woman, that was the first single authored book, but showing our colors that, that she's talking about, that we talk about a lot, that was earlier. And it was published in the 1986. I believe I was already born. I was five years old. Meanwhile, if I'm not mistaken, the first text written by a black woman and published by a black woman in the United States was Phyllis Wheatley's poetry in 1776. So for as much oppression as I've experienced or bore witness to, I've always been, I've always been able to read a black woman, always. Black women were writing over a hundred years before I was even born slave narratives, Harriet Wilson, Harriet Jacobs. But for them to have, I mean, they could read our stuff, but you know, we know that, that that's particularly challenging, but to read the words of black German women wasn't even possible for them until many of them were adults. And so I think that that is something very powerful and something important to point out. Um, and, and that's why I'm so invested in, in, in challenging the underrepresentation and lack of study that I spoke about earlier. Um, and it's and I think that's critically important in this era, given the ways that um, the previous US um, presidential administration yielded comparisons between Donald Trump and Adolf Hitler, as well as the ways that debates in the US about the removal of Confederate monuments have relied in large part on limited understandings of Germany even by the so-called left. Um, so for example, during a CNN segment on removing these Confederate monuments, and if you're interested, there's a lot of great debate among black and oppressed people about that. That's, it's a rich debate. We don't all agree on whether or not those monuments should be removed. And it's not to say that those arguing they shouldn't are in support of, of what they represent, um, but there is debate. But during one of those segments on CNN, Democratic strategist and political commentator Simone Sanders claimed, and I quote, in Germany, there are no statues and monuments of Nazi soldiers. Children do not go to schools named after Nazi generals. And that was her sort of way of arguing for the removal of Confederate statues and monuments in the US. 
And while Sa Sanders is correct that Germany has abolished official Nazi monuments and monument-like structures that honor um, Nazis, monumental structures that honor German colonialism and that carry harmful racist connotations still exist. And when you learn more about Hitler, he modeled a lot of his strategies on German colonialists. So there are, in fact, while you may, I mean, I've seen swastikas in Germany spray painted on subways, not, not a lot, but I've seen them, but we're talking about official state sanction. While Nazi monuments are not state sanctioned, German colonial monuments still exist. Um, I became aware of this when um, my colleague Josephine Apraku began conducting annual walking tours with me and my students about German colonialism. And during that tour, she teaches about the many street signs named for German colonists and colonies in the African quarter of Berlin in the borough of Bedding. One is actually still named for the first concentration camp built in 1904 by Germans in Namibia. There's still a street named for that. Um, further, um, in response to that, Josephine was instrumental in organizing the first Black Lives Matter actions in Berlin, which, you know, Dr. Fraser Rath asked me about earlier this week in the first March, which I attended in June 2017, began at, and my German is terrible, it's non-existent, but the, the March in 2017 began at Mordenstrasse, which is a street name being protested because Moor, M-O-H-R has historically been used as a disparaging term for people of the African diaspora. So often you'll go to subway stops there and see the more um, either scratched out or they'll, or, or protesters, activists will put two umlauts, the two little dots over top of the stuff. They'll put that on top of the O because then it changes the meaning of the word. So, so I think that when I hear, you know, the left, talk about Germany and the way that they do on such large mass media platforms like CNN, it concerns me because then it circulates in a, 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 um, a very dangerous narrative about, about the progress of Germany. Um, so it's important, um, but, but, but I had a lot, a lot to learn myself, which is why I still love to teach the course because I also get to learn a lot in ways that I don't necessarily get to learn a lot in the same way when I teach other courses on my campus. So, but my course was designed and is regularly revised in careful co collaboration with myriad activists, artists, and scholars who I now call comrades and friends, including many living friends of, uh, and collaborators with Audre Lorde. A rest in peace to Ika Hugo Marshall. She was one of them until she passed away not too long ago. Um, so in the course, um, well, I'll, I'll say a little bit about the name change. So, so when I when I first started thinking about the course, I was thinking about black women all the time. And it was called Afro, it was called it's something, the invisible women, Afro German, something. And the more we started to do it, we started, to, and I say we, I don't have like a co-instructor necessarily. I mean, we, the people that I collaborate with, we started thinking about intersectionality in broader terms. Um, so the course is still focused uh, I don't want to say primarily, it's the center of Black women, and I always sort of like look at who's speaking to my students who we're spending time with to ensure that that's who they hear from most. Um, but we are also thoughtful, as I mentioned in the course description, about other subjugated and oppressed groups in Germany as well, Jewish Germans, Turkish Germans, LGBTQI Germans, who may be Black but who may not, and, and so on. Um, the course's new title, Hidden Spaces, Hidden Narratives, Intersectionality Studies in Berlin, reflects the relationship between various state sanctioned narratives about Germany and Berlin and the narratives marginalized communities tell about themselves. For instance, during our 2014 free tour of Berlin, 2014 is the first year I taught the course. Um, so during our free tour of Berlin provided by an international tour company, we visited the Holocaust Memorial, of course, and our tour guide mentioned that some members of, the Jew of Jewish communities have problems with the memorial. And when one of my students inquired about those concerns, you know, wanting to hear more about that dialogue, about that discourse, the tour guide was rather dismissive. Um, instead, he focused his comments on reasons why Jewish communities should be thankful, in so many words, for Germany's admittance of guilt. So basically, he's like, I don't really know why they're upset about it, but they really, in my opinion, they shouldn't be upset about it because, um, they, you know, Germany even did that Berlin even did this and admitted its guilt is 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 important. 
And, but what I found out later, no thanks to him, is that I don't know if you've seen pictures of the Holocaust Memorial, but there are these large gray concrete pillars meant to represent the victims of the Holocaust. And they stagger in size and width and you can walk through them. And the, the, the you know, culture suggests, and I always adhere, that you walk through quietly and contemplatively. So like, it's not really a good idea. People do it, but people will jump on them and use them. It's, 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 it's something else. I mean, I can understand if children immediately do that and the parents are like, no, oh, you know, we don't do that here. Um, but it's meant to be a quiet contemplative space. The issue that some members of the Jewish community had with it is that it was so anonymized. There were no names, there were no dates. It was, they're just these pillars meant to represent. And so in response to that, they added an addendum to the monument where you can go down in the basement and you can see the names of all the known victims of the Holocaust scrolling. Right. So whatever one thinks about that, whatever one's opinion is about that, it would have been nice for the guy to just simply say, well, this is what the issue was. And, you know, what do you think? What do you think? What do you think? Instead, he sort of was um, operating through what I referred to earlier is that state sanctioned narrative of we did a horrible thing. We apologize for it. We feel really guilty about it. So here you're welcome. Um, similarly, we noted that some tour guides working for mainstream companies were flippant about the implications of the fall of the Berlin Wall, suggesting that all was well and that everyone was happy after the wall fell, rather than spending a lot of time discussing the rise and fall of the wall through intersectional and transnational lenses, which when you do that, you learn that the fall of the wall did not automatically lead, did not automatically lead to the kind of mass um, commitment to unity and reunification as the state sanctioned narrative suggests. Um, for these reasons, my comrade and friend, Dr. Celine Berry noted after my 2014 course, I'm glad we started our project of researching the multiple narratives of the city and confronting them and locating ourselves within these dividing hierarchies. And Celine, who's my age is great. Like we're really close. It's great because she'll do stuff with us in the course. She'll speak from her perspective, but she'll also just come with us on, on tours and things. She was my first course associate in 2014. And even for her who grew up in Berlin, taking the course with us or participating in various events has taught her so much about the history of her own city. Because you know, when you live somewhere, you don't often engage it through that historical perspective. You sort of just take it for granted. Like this is where I live. I don't know what that is. And, and, and for her, I mean, she grew up in the French Quarter um, during the rise of the of the wall. She didn't even, I mean, and, and if you ever have a chance to read the, the final chapter, she's the last chapter of the book. She talks about like, I didn't even know. I mean, I didn't know. I mean, I knew that there was a wall, but I grew up in France and she speaks like a French person. If you remember the clip of her in the video, I'm always like, How? because she grew up <laughs> in the French quarter, her father is Senegalese. So it's just really interesting to think about the way that that wall shaped so much of how even Berliners understand themselves and experience themselves as, 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 as um, members of that community. Um, the course title also reflects my intellectual commitment to the study of storytelling and counter storytelling, which relies in large part on the work of critical race theory scholars who define counter storytelling as a method of telling the story of those people whose experiences are not often told. And the stories we tell in here are also primarily experiential and dialogic, which manifests, especially during the walking tours we take um, to study the histories of marginalized people, such as the Jewish history and culture tour we take, um, the German colonialism tour we take, which I referenced earlier. Um, and we also take among many, um, a tour about the student movement of 1968, We've taken tours on women's perspectives, women's resistance. Um, we always take a tour on queer history and culture. We always take a tour on um, uh, Cynthia and Roma history and culture with the youth that I talked about earlier this week. Um, we also visit, visit, visit NGOs or nonprofit organizations committed to addressing oppression. Um, even as we foster a critique, 
of what people refer to as the nonprofit industrial complex. Um, we participate in convergence classes with my comrades who are teaching at the time, um, even as we foster a critique of the academy. We attend workshops at museums that document the histories and contemporary experiences of subjugated communities, even as we are critical of museum and archive culture. And we listen to cross-generational discussions with artists, activists, and scholars that share our intellectual commitments. Um, like all of my classes on campus and off, I often assign collaborative, creative, and critical media, uh, critical mixed media final projects in the tradition of cultural studies to communicate the significance of examining the interplay between lived experience, texts or discourses, and social context. Throughout the course then, my students write and publish blogs or produce podcasts that describe and analyze their experiences. I'm gonna give you a link to all that in the chat once I shut the screen down here in a few minutes. Um, um, but then I publish those on my Fem Geniuses website and share them on um, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, Tumblr, SoundCloud, um, which is especially important to me concerning this course for two reasons. Um, first, it was important for me to share our experiences with communities that do not have access to the course. Um, while my dream has always been for marginalized students, especially Black ones, to benefit primarily from the work I do in the academy, it must be noted that Colorado College is an institution that primarily serves students that are privileged across many social, cultural, and political axes. Therefore, my website and the other social media spaces allow me to destabilize that exclusion by allowing more people to share in our learning experiences, as well as to allow my students to develop their ability to produce decolonized knowledge. Second, um, sharing our experiences is also important for my comrades in Berlin, my friends. Um, for example, in response to the time Yasmin spent with my students in, in 2015, um, she wrote, the lives and struggle of Black people in Germany is not well known in the US. So I was thankful to share some of our experiences in Germany, knowing that our stories will be shared in the US. This will strengthen solidarity, which is very important among activists and organizations here and there, oh, sorry, especially to fight racism and to share experiences of resistance. But still, this has been no crystal stair. I mean, I've been doing this for a really long time. It could not have all been fun and great and solidarity and amazing, <laughs> which is why um, the book is committed to, as I, as, I, as, as, as Dr. Fraser Rath said, and I'll say it again, um, it's committed to the always advantageous, but sometimes contentious contours of solidarity. We don't want to romanticize solidarity and make it seem like, oh, well, you know, the Black people, we just get together and we play in Black Lives Matter and we go out and we march and we do. No. Um, um, and, and, and on that note, one of my students was tasked with writing about one of our most difficult experiences in 2015. We experienced some major theoretical and material violence um, regarding some dangerous storytelling during um, a walking tour. Um, so I was conducting research the prior year and was so excited to learn that a local touring company was offering a tour, a walking tour on Turkish history and culture in Germany, a tour they thankfully no longer advertised last I checked. So I was geeked I was so excited I was like oh my god like I cannot believe this like this is amazing because I had already been connecting with Turkish folks in Berlin anyway and what I do with the walking tours is we on Tuesdays we go on a walking tour in the morning we had to do it in the afternoon when the Cynthia and Roma youth were in school <laughs> but we do the walking tour in the morning and then in the afternoon we go to a museum or archive that relates so when we do our queer tour in the morning we go to the Schwulz Museum in the afternoon we do Josie's German colonialism tour and we either go to Jolie Ba a community organization focused on um on solidarity and, and, and resistance in the afternoon or the Noyes Museum to see the current manifestations of colonialism, right? So I'm like, oh my God, a Turkish tour, that is amazing. Well, when I arrived at the meeting location, the guy shows up and he's a white guy. Now, first of all, that was a red flag, but, and I wasn't going to simply just assume that he didn't know his stuff. I give everybody the benefit of the doubt. I mean, we do have white tour guides for the queer tour. We have a white tour guide for the graffiti tour. So it's not as though white guys are not allowed in, in my space. But it did raise suspicions because you are not Turkish. So I'm wondering what kind of work you must have done to be able to do this tour effectively. All right. So 
We get to the meeting location. The guy walks up to me. We're, me and the students are, and, and my friends are like, who, Lord? He comes right up to me and says, hey, I don't really know much about Turkish history and culture. I did some Wikipedia. I got on Wikipedia. Um, my boss just asked me to do this tour. And I got on Wikipedia to prepare. I was horrified. But the students were coming. Like some students were already there. I get there to everything early, of course. And the students are coming and I'm under pressure. And this is only my second time teaching the course ever, right? So I'm like, oh my God, what do I do? What do I do? So I'm like, okay, you know what? We're gonna meet with my comrade Mutlu tomorrow. Turkish dude, the hip hop dude. So I'm like, if, if, if this guy doesn't know as much as, as he, he doesn't clearly, then I'll just talk to Mutlu about it and, and, and we'll just figure this out together or something. I don't know what I was, I was so nervous. So I was like, okay, well, you know, I can use this as a teaching opportunity, a learning opportunity. <laughs> you know, well, rather than addressing and problematizing hurtful narratives and fantasies about the bad criminal Turk, which we'd read about, by the way, we always do readings that attach to everything we do. Our tour guide played into those stereotypes. More specifically, I ended the tour after 30 minutes and read his ass for filth for what must have felt like four hours. My students was recording me like, get him, Dr. Lewis, get him. Because we go to Kreuzberg and we go to a store that I already knew about. It's a t-shirt shop and it was run by a former member of the 36 boys. And the 36 boys was a crew, um, mostly Turkish young boys who who get a bad rap because they were so-called thugs and gangsters. But what those stereotypical narratives don't tell you is that those guys were dealing with a lot of neo-Nazi terrorism as lots of black and brown communities were in Berlin after the fall of the Berlin Wall. And they became like an internal security crew for the neighborhood. Because these neo-Nazi terrorists were coming into the community doing mass, doing violence to people. And the 36 boys would come and, 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 and respond. Let's just put it that way. I don't want to romanticize the 36 boys. I'm sure they did things that I would go, oh my goodness. But to only tell the narrative that they were bad criminals is a problem. Not only that, we get in front of the t-shirt shop and the tour guide, this is when I stopped the tour. The tour guide said, hey, we got to hurry up and get out of here because we probably will probably get stabbed. Okay. All right, so <laughs> now it's on, as they say. At that point, I mean, I, like I said, I fussed him out, talked about how offensive the tour is, snatched my money back. Um, he did, now he was shocked and horrified. I, I still have pictures <laughs> because my students are like taking pictures. His face is like, oh my God, he's crying. But he did listen and he did take notes. And as my student wrote in her blog about the experience, it should go without saying that an entire community and its history cannot be whittled down to a single Wikipedia search. Accurate, co accurate complex narratives demand passion and intellect, and clearly there was none within this man who declared to us that Turkish history is boring. Today was a spot on example of how racism continues to be deeply intertwined into this society. To be clear, the racist is not necessarily the blatant asshole on the street shouting derogatory terms. Many racists today are the ignorant and sometimes nice ones who do not care enough to educate themselves, end quote. Then, thankfully, I received a great deal of support from my friend Mutlu, as I mentioned earlier, before the, I had actually talked to him before the tour, I forgot about that. I actually talked to him before the tour and he was like, let's watch out for this, 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 this. If they say this, this, this type stuff is horrible. If they say this, 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 it, it, it might be all right, but I'll help you fill in the blanks. And then he came to speak with the students and commended my student on her blog. I sent it to him because I published them like right away. Um, commended her on the blog and proceeded to provide more complex and compassionate narratives about Turkish migration to Germany the way Tur the Young Turks embraced hip hop because um, of its resistive qualities, the way the 36 boys and other Turkish communities protected their communities by any means necessary, um, the way Turkish communities were often excluded from reunification narratives after the fall of the wall, um, renewed suspicion about Turkish communities that arose in, in Berlin after 9-11, and the continued ways Turkish communities resist oppression 
um, including through their artistic expression. Still, I feel compelled to know, I often lament that marginalized people often feel compelled and are often forced to spend so much time and energy resisting oppression in lieu of focusing on their ability to be generative and creative. As Toni Morrison says, um, the function and the very serious function of racism is distraction. It keeps you from doing your work. It keeps you explaining over and over again your reason for being. Somebody says you your, your head isn't shaped properly, you have students to prove it is. Somebody says you have no art, you get some art. Somebody says we have no kingdom, we find the kingdoms. And she says none of this is necessary because there will always be one more thing. Um, however, what I have learned about the critical alliance work, um, about critical alliance work throughout my time developing and facilitating the course is that my comrades and I embrace work um, committed to educating the young people to whom we, we feel we're responsible. And while it's not necessarily my, it wasn't necessarily my responsibility to spend 20 minutes, what felt like an hour educating that tour guide about the violence he was doing. And it wasn't necessarily Mutlu's responsibility to correct those narratives that the tour guide was spreading. We both took on that task to ensure that my students and everyone who read those blogs, um, read those blogs had clarity about the necessity of critical storytelling. I mean, the blogs have become a thing in the podcast. My friends will come to class like, who's blogging me? Get sit up here with me and get some good pictures and videos. <laughs> so we really are careful about what kinds of narratives are, 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 are furthered on my website. Um, oh, I'll skip that because I'm gonna have some questions. Um, Well, I will just say that the convergence classes, which I do at Cardinal College as well, um, illustrates my commitment to multidisciplinary work. Um, so it's not just that we get together and, you know, somebody's a historian, I'm a Black Studies scholar, and we come together. It is that. But really what we're trying to do is bring intellectuals from different disciplines together together. Um, to collaborate, draw on their, interdis their disciplinary knowledge to create new things, create new ways of thinking and new ways of learning and new ways of teaching. Um, so whenever my friends are teaching, we do convergence classes. Two of them are teaching this summer when I'm there and we're not gonna be able to converge and I'm just devastated <laughs> because the days are all jacked up. And the, and the one friend I have who I always do it with is taking a job in the US. So I'm like, okay, you know what? Maybe we've come to the end. <laughs> <laughs> no, but things change, things change. So we usually like get together, we read something in common or we watch something in common and we talk about it together. Like we just get together. And it's so amazing because my students are like still social media, social media friends with people that they met in these convergence classes. It's, 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 it's wild. Um, this year, it'll be fun because we've never done this before, but I was invited when I was in Berlin in November to speak to a group of students um, in two different universities and several students in, in, the, in that digital room and the in-person room were like leaders of their black student unions and things like that. So we may not do a convergence class this year, but we are gonna get our students together with those student leaders to talk about the ways that they do resistance on their campuses. So that'll be fun and something new. I always try to do something new. Um, and so the last thing I'll say is that I hope you um, I hope you take a look at the website, the blog, the podcast. I know Dr. Fraser Rath is going to have you doing some pretty cool critical stuff. Um, and I hope that you, I mean, maybe you all can like make an Instagram or make a Twitter or something so that people can follow your work and see what you're doing and more people in your networks. I mean, I have a large network, but it's not the largest network in the world, right? So maybe you can share that work with your network so that they can learn about how um, complex and rich and nuanced those histories and cultures are in Berlin. Um, and yeah, I'm going to stop there because I think we literally have like, what, how much more time? We have a half an hour now. Oh, good. Yeah. Perfect. Okay. That's what yeah. I want. Okay, good. I went <laughs> off script. I never go off script. I always go off script with students. Like whenever I'm with grown adults, I'm always like, da, 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 da. I think it's the fear. I think it's the power dynamic. I'm like, I don't know. I, I can go off script with the young people. So go oh, good. So we have good amount of time. Look at those links, Dr. Fraser Rath. 
Yes. I'm so I'm going to yeah. I'm going to put the link and if you go to that link I can mine won't link. But if you go to that you can find out more about the book and the course with all the podcasts, the blogs, everything from 2014 to the present. So yes. The heat is on now. Questions time. No. I'm kidding. I'm just crossing off like, okay, I talked about that. I talked about that. <laughs> Olivia. Oh, okay. um, so as you we were learning or getting into learning about like Black Germans and just like Black stories in different contexts, how did you have to restructure your learning or like your thinking as a Black American? I had to be more attentive to my own privileges. I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm supremely attentive to my privileges as a, a, a heterosexual person and a cisgender person. It's just that I've read and studied so much Black queer studies that I know better than to situate, you know, any of those things is like equal to, you know what I mean? So, um, but I, but I, with my students, I especially talk a lot about that so that they know that my critique of privilege isn't just to people who have ones that I don't, that it's also internal. But when I started to um, think about study and read about and go to Berlin, it was like it, it, it happened in a way that I'd never experienced it before. My my U.S. citizenship had been something I thought about um, given my relationship to study and meeting, getting to know undocumented um, people here, especially now that I live in the Southwest. I live in Colorado, which is way closer to the U.S.-Mexico border than where I grew up in Ohio. Like we had one Puerto Rican kid in my whole hometown when I was growing up, I lived in the black white binary. I'm from Ohio. So it was the black white binary until I moved to Columbus, Ohio. And then, then there was a lot of people from the Asian diaspora when I lived there, but I didn't know nothing about the Latin diaspora, all like that, except from media. Well, then it, so it was a lot more pronounced. Like I always say, <laughs> and I'm, I'm black, so I make jokes about inappropriate shit, sorry. Um, but I'm always like, I have the most gangster passport in the world. Like, I can't believe that. Like, man, you just whip that thing out and it's like, move peasants. I never experienced that kind of power. I was like, oh, damn, my God. And I'm still black for sure. I mean, I get looked at like a zoo animal all the time in Berlin. Um, the staring, I mean, it's, it's, I, 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 so I feel acutely American, but also acutely black. And think about what they must think about, know about black America in Germany, if they're not serious about relationship building. They think, I'm, I don't know what they think I am, but I can guess. So it's really, really complicated. But when I started connecting with people that I care deeply about, like the most vulnerable, the most marginalized, I had to be thoughtful about that. Um, that's why I didn't do my book right off the bat. I didn't think about it um, right off the bat, honestly. And then when I did, I, I wanted to, because I wanted the book to be a collaborative enterprise. I wanted it to be a, a, a collaborative project with friends. I didn't want to sort of be, I didn't want to, you know, give life to their suspicions that I was just some US scholar trying to use them to further my career. So even though I'm black, I still have the, you know, I have a PhD from the US. I have a tenure track job from the US. I didn't have tenure when I first started going to Berlin. So I was really thoughtful about like how my relationships with them related to my tenure, because like I said, I didn't want as much as possible to, you know, further that suspicion that I was going to use them to get tenure and then bye-bye, never to see or hear from me again. So that's kind of like the way I'd sum it up. Like on the one hand, it's like, I feel my privilege is really hard. On the other hand, I feel my blackness really hard. On the other hand, I don't care. And on the other hand, I really, really care. Like depending on, on who it is, I really care about that. So yeah, I mean, I've been accused. I, I asked my old granny friends, I'm like, did everybody like Audrey? I mean, somebody must, have, one day I literally, somebody must have hated this bitch. I mean, everybody couldn't have been like Audrey. Audrey, Lord. Come on now, I know Black people too well to think that everybody in Berlin was like, oh my God, Audrey Lorde, thank you for coming and creating the term Afro-German. We would not be anywhere without you. And Rhea Cheatham was like, oh yeah, no, there, there were people who were like, who the hell does she think she is coming around here telling us what to call ourselves? You know, we don't need her to tell us that we Afro-German. 
Now, granted, we didn't wasn't calling ourselves anything for that, but we don't need her <laughs> to be the one. And oh, that's happened to me too. It's a few people in Berlin who cannot stand me. And it's mutual. I can't stand them either. At first, I was like, oh my gosh, you know, oh no, somebody doesn't like me. I'm a Virgo, I'm an only child. So I'm like, oh no, who I'm like Zora No Herson. Who doesn't like me? How? Like, what? Please grow up, Heidi. Oh, there's quite a few people that don't like me. And I had to deal with that. I had to just be like, okay, they have their reasons. I have mine. I know why I'm doing the work I'm doing. I'm not trying to exploit these people. I'm not trying to come up off these people. I Listen, the, the book is an independent, the, the book was published with an independent press. I'm not out here making big coin. Like, give me a break. I paid more for that book than it paid me so far. Uh, and that's no disrespect to the press. It's an independent grassroots activist press. They're not one of these well-funded presses that can send me on press tours to the BBC. You know what I mean? It's not that the press is bad. It's that the press is grassroots. So it's not like I'm coming up big time. However, it has benefited me and I've done everything I can to be of service to people in ways that they want and that are, are comfortable for me. That was a long way around, Olivia. Sorry. <laughs> that was a long way around. Other questions, comments, thoughts, concerns. Brayla, oh, Bray oh. oh, sorry. I think Brayla was first and then Carson, maybe. Yeah, sorry. Um, I yeah, I was just wondering um, how you see the role of language intersecting Ooh. your studies, and if you are interested in learning German or what you've been thinking about that. Yes. Oh my gosh. I'm so glad that you said that. And I'm glad that I talked about what I talked about today because Mutlu is the one I referred to earlier this week who, I mean, I've, I feel guilt for not learning German all the time, all the time. I'm always saying I need to just do it on my, my and, 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 and what makes it so bad, my daughter started studying Japanese almost two years ago and she's consistent. She, and I'm just watching my almost 16 year old daughter just learn whole Japanese and English is Germanic and I couldn't even learn German. I'm like, what a shame. However, um, that is a, a result of the lack of privileges that I had growing up. I mean, I grew up in impoverished US public schools, so we wasn't about to learn even the Spanish that they claimed to be teaching us. Please, now the more I learned about language learning and acquisition, there's no way we were gonna learn Spanish the way that they were teaching it to do the Macarena every Friday. That literally, we did the Macarena every Friday in Spanish class swear and watch Selena and didn't pay attention like it please so I wasn't fortunate enough to be able to learn things the when it's most critical right as a youth but I could have and I could I mean by now I always, every time I go back I'm like damn by now I could be fluent by now every summer by now I could be fluent by now I could be fluent the thing that makes me okay with that to a degree is number one um the privilege of being an English language speaker to go back to Olivia's point, or point right? Like I'm, I, I, I speak the most gangster language in the world too. So I get the privilege of people just speaking English to me. Like my, and I don't just mean my friends, I'll go into coffee shops and try to order coffee in German and they will be like, so that's a cappuccino. I'm like, oh God, like they, they get tired of that. They're like, I'm not your language teacher. What? Or it's like, we don't speak English. Get the hell out like and I'm like okay 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 sorry I say sorry so much in German I'm sorry actually Dana my co-author says it way more than me and then Mutlu did not help because in 2015 I was telling him about that guilt and he was like why do you care to learn another colonizer language you already know one if you're gonna learn anything why not you know Senegalese why do I not? and I was like oh you should have never told me that because now I don't give a shit about learning white German language. But it is an impediment, but it does also allow me to situate myself as a problem and to think about why it's a problem, but why it's also a complicated problem and, and all that. So yeah, I'm probably not gonna learn it at this point. Uh, I mean, I'm 40 and I've been going here since 2014. And the, the grannies tease me because Tiffany Florville, my colleague who blurbed the book speaks perfect good. And Heidi doesn't speak any German, but now it's a gag. It's like a running gag. But I, but I love that question, and my students ask it too. And I just have to tell the truth about it, and that's the truth about it. I'm not saying that truth is right or wrong. That's just the truth about it. Like 
he should have never told me that. When he said colonizing language, I was like, oh, I'm not learning this. <laughs> then it was resistive. <laughs> it's not, it's lazy. Other questions. Somebody else had one and you all were, so yes, Carson. Yes. Um, so one, thank you for being here. Um, I loved hearing all your stories and how you've kind of built bridges between all these different communities and groups, um, just between like the actual self-driven course and then being in Germany and meeting other incredible um, like individuals, especially those that are female and also black German. Yes. So I was wondering when it comes to creating all these connections that you have, it's not necessarily something you're taught in a degree. <laughs> and so I'm wondering like, what's been challenging about that and what has helped you build these bridges? Thank you so much for that question. Cause it really allows me to say something I wanted to say, even if it didn't think, but it does. Um, so thank you. Number one, it's it, it really isn't hard for me um, to build relationships. I'm sure you, in this short time, you could see why. Uh, <laughs> I'll talk to whoever about whatever. I mean, I'm not the person who talks to the person next to me on the plane. So I'm also weird like that, where I'm like, Uber driver, please, like, don't talk to me. Because I just, I talk so much that I like cherish those times of like, shh, because when I get out of this Uber, I'm going to be da 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 but I always say that this course is like the most kitchen table blackest course ever because it's just, it is, and there are a thousand million, billion ways to be black. And my, my understanding of that even expanded from my relationships with Germany. And just to Olivia, to kind of to your question earlier, like I, I tease my friend Celine, who I, like her sons, I'm always like, they're black in Germany, not in the US. <laughs> Cause there's a way in which race is pronounced differently. I mean, race is phenotype, skin color, nose, hair, race is visual, ethnicity is different. That's culture, that's history, right? So I'm not speaking about their ethnicity as African, um, Afro-German boys, but her little boys look white in the US. They're like logic, you know, the rapper logic. I'm always like, okay, to me, and this is a debate amongst black people, logic to me is white with a black dad. Ain't no police pulling no strap out on you. For what? You look like a white boy. Come on now. And then there's the black debate of like, well, black is multicolored. I'm like, then what is black then? I, you know what I want to ask logic? How do we know your dad is black? I'll wait. Anyway, anyway, but in Berlin, East Germ, I mean, East Euro Eastern Europeans are racialized. So I expanded a lot of my own knowledge is about what, how race is and how it functions differently and how the way it functions differently forms our opinions. My opinion is just one. Um, it's well-researched now, don't get it twisted. I mean, it ain't the same as the opinion of whoever, but at the same time, I'm situated in a particular side of the debate and I'm fine there. Um, but for my way of being black, I learned to do that. That's what I learned. You got to you know, you connect with people, you know, this is how you talk to people, you, you, you find common ground, you celebrate difference, you, you know, you just talk, I mean, you, and I was honest, when I started contacting people, I was like, look, I'm, I'm, I'm a professor at Carl College in the Feminist and Genocide Program, I'm thinking about doing this course, I'm not going to pretend that I know a lot about German history and culture, but I do know a lot about what you all study, because like I said, they don't, they don't have as much of a body of scholarship on race and racism. So a lot of their ideals about race and racism that aren't informed primarily or entirely by their experiences, they rely a lot on US scholars and UK scholars to theorize race and racism, which I think is an issue. Some of them don't, we talked about that. And Josephine's like, I don't think that's a big deal at all. Other people are like, I do, I think it's a problem. And that's why we need to write our own scholarship, right? So there's a debate there. And these are all black people debating each other. And I was very honest about that. I said, I do know that stuff. And I know you know that stuff. So maybe we can get together. I can share what I know. You can share what you know, and we can just dialogue with my students and I'm paying. I never asked anybody to do anything for free either. So that made it not easy, but easier. Now I have a white name, as I said earlier this week. And so there were people who just were automatically deleting my emails. Like, who is this white person? Like, no, you're not coming here. We're not helping you and you're not learning from us. No. And then there were some people who were like, who is this? And Googled me or clicked the links in my buy or my signature or, you know, or some people who just, have a different take on people doing that 
you know, reaching out and saying, so those are the things that made it easy. And those are the things that made it difficult. I mean, people said that they, I mean, people were circulating that narrative at first that I was coming to Berlin to teach about black Germans. I was like, I never said that. I never, how? So the struggle was the ways that the suspicion took over the truth. And actually it is whose chapter something, two, chapter two, she worked at a nonprofit organization and there is a person there that fueled that narrative between me and her and like kept tried to divide us. So like she'd be telling it is that I was doing this, which I wasn't. And she'd be telling me that it is was suspicious of me and didn't want to deal with me. So thank God for my way of being black. Cause when I got there, I pulled ears right to the side, like, hey, do we have a problem <laughs> in real life? Cause I'm like, if you, I mean, if you think that we should talk about that, right? Cause I'm not doing that. And it is was like, well, it was communicated to me that blah, 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 blah. And I was like, no, like I'm not, now we are like this, we are like this. So thank God, like, I don't love confrontation, but I will do it in service to my name and my reputation and my work. So yeah, that, that was tough though, because I was, there were people like really misconstruing what I was doing. And I had to learn how to the balance between fighting that actively and just realizing that people talk and they gonna talk and I can't control all of it. Yeah. And I said, sorry, when I was, when I did stuff wrong, what did I do wrong? I've done wrong stuff. I don't know. Look, nothing. I've never done anything wrong. So. I have. I just can't think right now. I'll think, but I want to make sure somebody else has a question. I'm, I'll write it down so I don't think. <laughs> Where have I done? I've done something. Rebecca oh. or Steffi, do you have any? Yeah. Can I ask one of your questions? My questions were actually both answered at the beginning. So. Uh, yeah. Thank you. Steffi? Yeah. Thank you so much for being here. I absolutely love your energy. It's Thank really you. engaging. So, <clears throat> sorry, my question is, in your book, you mentioned that silencing can be both a means of protection and can also be dangerous when you combine it with shame. Do you think silence is ever the right course of action? Yes. <laughs> yep. And I always tell my students, I'm like learning when that is and where that is and why that is, is that's what our experiences should teach us. But I think the earlier you start asking it, like you are now, I wasn't asking myself that question when I was your age. So it probably took me longer to figure out, figure it out than it will you. And I'm not saying that the figuring out means you'll always have the right answer. Sometimes I'm silent and I feel like I should have said something. Sometimes I'm silent. And I'm like, good, I'm glad that I was. Sometimes I choose to be silent Sometimes I let myself be silenced. And I think it just, it, it really depends. And I, and I know every uh, people hate that. They're like, oh my God, can you just give me something? And I mean, like, so I look at it like, I'm trying to spend the majority of my energy on the people and places and things that I enjoy, that enjoy me, that I respect, that respect me. Like, because there is work to be done. That's why I'm always focusing on the discourse among Black people and among women and among queer people, because I think we think that the most important work we do is across the aisle. It's like me as a Black person, the, the, the most important work I could do is help white people with their racism. I'm like, well, what about Black people and their sexism? What about Black people and their homophobia? My friend Aisha, who's an activist around sexual assault, always says, white people could disappear today. Black women will still get sexually assaulted. So what about that? Like our, everything is not about white people and for hetero or, or for LGBTQ people, everything significant for your life is not fixing me, the heterosexual. You got, my daughter is queer. Why don't you build a relationship with her and teach her her history and love on her and give her a hug and give her a kiss and tell her she matters. And why spend all your time trying to stop me from being homophobic? But how do you balance that's what you learn over time. So I like to spend the majority of my time and energy within my communities, working with each other on our stuff. So if I'm able to, because some stuff happens in the moment and you just get caught off guard, like, woof. Sometimes I say, you know what? 
this white woman can have her racism today. I don't have time because you know what? I'm tonight, I'm going to read the bluest eye with my students and my black students. And I, I want to be in a good mood for that. And if I'm and if I start fussing her out, I'm gonna be in a bad mood and that's gonna hurt my experience with them. Other times it's like, come on, Karen. I've got what they say, I got time today. So that's that's what that phrase is about. Black people always have the don't look to us for all the answers, but we have them. <laughs> That's, that's what that's articulating. Like I have time today, I might not tomorrow. So I think it's for each and every one of us to sort of learn what that means for us. Like some people say, no, I'm, I'm queer and I am gonna spend the majority of my time and energy fighting the homophobia of heterosexuals. More power to them. I'm not saying they're dumb or wrong or stupid, but I just think it's better when we are, look, my tattoo, deliberate, intentional like like so whatever your choice is i think you grow older and you make those decisions like this is who i want to and it'll change 13 14 years ago i would have been claiming logic like he was samuel l jackson i'd have been like logic yes thank you for claiming your blackness i love it today i feel a little differently i might feel differently when i'm 46 that's why i love the book because i feel differently about stuff i've said in it already there were supposed to be nine chapters there are only seven because two people felt so differently about themselves in 2018 that they were like i don't want that out and we were like okay but for us we're like oh i don't think that now i don't agree i don't feel that way to show that a relationship to thinking about oppression and resistance and justice isn't static. Oppression isn't static. So why would we be? Look, Dr. Pena and pop that camera on. So you know what that means? <laughs> I love that that's the signal. Like, hello. <laughs> but uh, but but any maybe one more. If 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 Dr. Pena maybe one. If anybody has one. If not, that's totally cool. But if you do, anybody? Okay. So you have the website, femgeniuses.com. It's the same on Facebook. It's the same on Instagram. Oh, it's Audrey's footsteps, though, on um, the other stuff for the book. Oh, you find one, you find them all. <laughs> they, they're all connected. This was so fun. Thank you. Thank you, Heidi, for joining us again this morning, and especially for being in conversation with our students. Many, many thanks to Emily, our students, and our sponsors for a fabulous and unforgettable semester. Today's recording will soon join the series playlist on our YouTube channel at Black Germans. Subscribe and turn on the notifications so that you'll be advised as new ones are added. Sign up for our newsletter and follow us on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and Eventbrite for details about coming events. We hope that you've enjoyed our Black Germany and Beyond event series as much as we have enjoyed hosting so many amazing guests and conversations. As always, we're grateful for your time and attention. See you again soon. <laughs>